Hello and welcome to Business Class. My name is Shantanu Prakash and today we have with us Indronil Dutt. Indronil is the Chief Financial Officer of ClearTrip. ClearTrip is one of the pioneers of the online uh, travel business in India. They are number two in India, they are number one in the Middle East and they do a whopping two billion dollars of cross merchandise value last year and they have more than 20 million people traveling with ClearTrip. Clearly, ClearTrip is a leader and a pioneer in this space. Indranil, welcome to the show. Absolutely, pleasure to be here. Indranil, as the CFO of ClearTrip, now you wear multiple hats. You're running a business in India, in Dubai, and now the latest acquisition in Saudi Arabia. So one of the first things that I want to understand from you is how do you manage this cultural diversity? You know, that's a that's a great question. Um, and it's one of the most fascinating things about just not only my role in ClearTrip, but ClearTrip in particular. You know, today we are present in eight markets at at multiple at various parts of the parts of the world, you know, uh, whether it is India, Middle East, um, the Saudi Arabia region, and then we have ambitions to grow into other markets as well. But what binds us together, right, is the unique sort of, and I remember reading this in my history books very, very long back when I was in school, a sort of a unity in diversity, right? There is, we, we probably have so many different cultures, people of different faiths, people of different uh, language, which is a very important uh, aspect coming together to work to work and enjoy a common cause that is clear trip right so it's managing a business that is uh, that's got you know it it obviously has to have its common thread of beliefs right you know which which is very important as a culture at clear trip right so embellishing that belief you know sort of making sure that every person who comes into the company from whatever part of the world is indoctrinated into the same set of core founding beliefs that we all believe in at ClearTrip is very important. And we find that once you've done that, the rest of the step, regardless of the um, particular nuances of a region that might exist, is very easy for us then to assimilate. And we've been blessed, we've been lucky, and I would even call it that we've been privileged to work with a set of extremely aspiring, bright people who've chosen to make ClearTrip the work area of their choice. And every day goes forward when all of us are collectively driving this company together forward. So uh, Indra Neil, as the Chief Financial Officer, obviously you have a vital role to play as uh, in some sense a right-hand person to the founder of the company, you operate the checks and balances in the organization. But let's sort of talk a little bit about uh, the human side of being a CFO. Sure. I know that you grew up in uh, Kolkata, uh, where the traditional um, route after passing high school is to take up a you know nice, good, well-paying job. <laughs> and so tell us a little bit about how did your career evolve from the time you first decided that you wanted to become a chartered accountant to now this uh, world of uh, internet, online commerce, making all these acquisitions in different countries. Uh, it's been quite a journey, isn't it? It's been a wonderful journey. And as they, you know, um, as they said, right, and, and there have been many, many sort of sub journeys into it, right? Um, I am reminded of a very interesting quote, right, you know, where they said that there are some journeys that have no endings. They just lead to new beginnings. And those are the journeys that will lead you to great adventure. I think my life, and I've, again, as I've probably been blessed to have a life that's been part of, you know, or, or embodiment of one such journey. So starting and growing up, being born and brought up in Calcutta, and like you rightly said, like a good uh, Bengali boy, if you will, I decided to take up a job because I preferred, um, you know, I think I needed a lot to learn as well as I preferred the stability over an entrepreneurial journey. But the idea to start something of my own has always been there. And what I found is that there are two ways you can do this, right? One is, like you said, 
you know, you become an entrepreneur yourself, or the other is be part of a team that's running or setting up successful companies, large operations, and therein you're getting pretty much all that what you wanted if you strongly believe in the idea that you are, um, you know, in the idea that you are doing or, 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 or the job that you are doing. So, yes, it's been a fascinating journey. I've not just, you know, I, as I said, I, was, I came out of Calcutta, but I lived in Bombay. I lived in the U.S. for a long time, come back to Bangalore um, and, and through multiple companies, pretty much been in technology and technology services, product companies all my, all my life. And uh, uh, as I like to say, I've, I've sort of become buzzword compliant in technology. <laughs> Very fascinating, Indranil. So, Indranil, I was talking to you a bit earlier. And I figured out that you've worn multiple hats in your life. Sure. Uh, you've been chief operating officer of a company. You've been chief financial officer of a company. You've actually even attempted to start a company, an investment bank yourself. And now you find yourself uh, as the right-hand person in ClearTrip. So one of the things that always fascinates me about the whole entrepreneurial ecosystem in India is that we are moving from very structured organizations to a world where agility, startup culture has become so all pervasive and it is sort of celebrated uh, that companies have to be very flexible, they need to have very quick decision making. But many times we see that some of these really super fast, agile, hyper growth organization fail and falter because they don't have a very strong a base in terms of processes and checks and balances. And my view is that the office of the chief financial officer oftentimes brings that level of sanity uh, to the founders who are usually visionary and they want to do big things in the shortest possible period of time. So in this role, in a very fast growing company like ClearTrip, how do you balance agility and a vision with the sanity that's required to run a sustainable business? Very interesting question. I think I'd like to answer this a little differently. Let's get back to saying that, you know, you, one of the things that you mentioned is that what makes a person a founder, right? You know, that, that, was, that was the, why, why do people find, uh, start companies, right? Make no mistake, right? You know, there has to be an asymmetrical leadership position in a company. There can only be one leader in a company and that is the CEO of the company because he or she controls the identity of the organization at a very broad level. What the CFO does is he, not, he doesn't supplement the CEO, he complements the CEO. So what I do in my role is that I, I complement the CEO and where we are saying that in order for a business to succeed, seven out of the ten decisions have to get right. Right. If you leave it to a CFO CEO combine, you are pretty sure that you're going to have that outcome. If you leave it to any one of those individuals, and I say this in jest, so please take it for what it's worth. If you leave it to the CFO, nine out of the 10 decisions will happen, but it will not happen on time. <laughs> if you leave it to the CEO, indeed, you know, they will all, uh, they will perhaps happen, you know, faster than usual, but you know, a lot of the outcomes might not be the right, uh, the, the conducive thing for the business. So I think that that's where two individuals coming in with very different but a common objective is indeed required to take a business on to the next level. Indranil, in India, that now that we have entered the golden era of entrepreneurship, where it has become really sexy to become a founder of a company, Absolutely. And all the spotlight for all the right reasons goes to the founder. But one of the things that I've been studying is that actually it is not just the founder. It is the founding team around the founder that makes the magic happen. And But that team never really comes out that much into the limelight. So as the CFO, and you've seen many founders operate across verticals, across industries, just wanted to get your perspective on how important it is for founders to build strong core teams. It's as important as making the business succeed. Because if you don't have that, one thing is for sure, the business cannot run. Right? 
That's that's one. And so having said that, if you were to fall back onto football, right? You know, while the center forward scores the goals, it is the quarterback that either supplies the passes or defends the position. So having and and there is a reason, right? You know, as I said earlier in my excerpt, the found there is a reason why asymmetry exists. The there is a reason why there can only be one leader in the an organization, and that is the founder and the CEO, right? Because and a lot of people, like you said, that well, it's the teams that build it. But guess what? The founder believed in the idea when nobody believed in it, and there is a place in and time in history for that. And continues, and that journey doesn't end there. That journey continues where he manages to make other people be equally convinced of that idea and together they take the organization forward. So therefore, yes, having a founding team is critical. It's as critical as, as, as running the business. And, but more importantly, imbibing the, those same founding values in the team so that they now speak as a founder, right? I mean, uh, is, is equally important. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about clear trip. So I believe that you have a British founder and there is an interesting story about he, how he came to India and got married here and decided to start a, a business in India. And now you have a multinational team that is spread in different parts of the world. So when you look at the way culture has been imbibed in the company and how you transmit it to all the team members in different locations, what are the lessons that you can derive from the unique culture of creative is very well known True. for its empathetic culture of binding people together, being a good organization in that sense. So talk to us a little bit about how important is the, is the culture of the organization and how does it get transmitted from the top and reach all the way up to the bottom? It's a very interesting question and something that I was wondering when on my way over here, right? You know, this program is about founders. And while we were chatting offline, I told you, you know, I was, I am not a founder of this organization, right? But I'd like to call myself as a founder of ClearTrip, right? Why? Because while I am officially not the founder, I carry with me the same set of beliefs that the founding team had started with. Of course, those beliefs have gone through changes over time, right? While the core philosophy remains the same, right? The underlying action verbs have changed from time to time. You know, our core philosophy was making travel simple, right? While what was in 2006, what was making travel simple is different from how it is making travel simple today, right? So while some of those core beliefs or core principles of, of making travel simple have changed, the underlying philosophy of starting the company and then passing it on, not just to the core team, which is folks like me, but to every person across the company. We have 700 founders at ClearTrip. That's what we believe in. And this is not a, this is not a statement. It is something that we follow through diligently every two years or even shorter than that, we would engage as a team, if required, get external help to understand what are those founding beliefs, have they changed and what can we do better or what is some of the feedback that's resonant from the market as well as our own people. It's a structured process where we define, you know, uh, those three, we, we keep it to keep it short. So we keep it three, you know, for example, today it is absolute transparency, deep integrity and complete efficiency. These are the Fantastic. So that's yeah. sort of the three tenets for which creative stands for. And that's the identity of the brand that will take it forward. This will be now rolled out over a very strong ceremonialized process to people through workshops, through integrations, to feedback and every an opportunity over the next two years at every opportunity, we will remind ourselves that these are the founding beliefs so that at any point of time, regardless of which function the person works for, you could say that there are 700 founders in Creative and and grow and who will continue to grow and take the company beyond. So, so Indrin, I want to ask you a very personal question. Sure. You, as the CFO, you are the first port of call for your founder whenever anything goes wrong in the company, right? Or at least guide him and uh, coach him as to what are the right things to do, at least from a financial 
in financial strategy uh, perspective. And over the years, you've worked with a whole bunch of different founders. Does it ever strike you uh, that you could be an entrepreneur yourself? Absolutely. And this is something that I've, I've uh, wondered for quite a while, right? You know, in some senses, I believe that I am an entrepreneur. I do not think of the business as a job that I go to. Right. And by the way, my founder also calls me when a lot of things go right, you know, so I just want to make sure that uh, we, get, we get that, we get that clarified. But yes, um, coming back to, to me as a person, as an individual, right, you know, would I like to start a company? Absolutely. If the opportunity and the idea so presents itself, as I like to say, what derives, what describes a founder, right? You know, why would I find a company? Because I am convinced of an idea. And if that conviction it, it doesn't have to be my idea. As long as I am convinced that this idea itself is good, even if it emanated or originated from somebody else, and I'm happy to be part of the journey, I see, I see no problems with all, which is what, you know, sort of the current role that I'm doing. But in future, if there is something that I am very passionate about and I am convinced about, I absolutely would love to start a company and, you know, follow my own journey, however it takes me. So one of the interesting things that you've done is, you bought a company in Saudi Arabia. Sure. Now, most people, when they think of acquisitions, they think of Europe, US, South Asia. Uh, but Saudi Arabia would be a very interesting uh, market to operate in. So tell us a little bit about how did that acquisition happen? So, as Clear Trip, we had gone into Saudi almost three to four years back. We realized that while we got up to a certain level and scale, we needed to have that local presence and, and, and the local nuance. You know, it is a predominantly Arabic speaking market. That is a country under transformation, right? It's a massively large, young, digitally savvy. You will be surprised that it has the largest number of social media users in the, in the entire Middle East. I am surprised. Right? They're massively active on social media. <laughs> okay. So if you have a large digitally savvy population with the propensity to travel, and they and, and Saudis do have a lot of uh, generic propensity to travel. And it's a large domestic market as well. That is a great place to be in. But why clear trip? Why wasn't this acquisition done by a large uh, OTA from the US or even from China? Uh, do you see that there is a new trend coming up when Indian businesses are having the courage to go out and make some of these deals? I would say Indian businesses always had the courage. It is just that there was a regulatory framework in India. And well, we do happen to be, you know, the, there are parts of our business that are incorporated outside of India. But the core, we were born in India. So we were made, you know, the technology was made in India. And we have thrived in an environment which is perhaps the most demanding consumer ever. The Indian consumer is very demanding. Taking that expertise, what we have done is we have built a scalable platform which can now go into virtually any market in the world, localize it, and then render, render our services, right? You know, that's been our story, if you will. But so I, I, would, I would say that we've certainly had the ability, the confidence to venture out. And today, it represents more than half of our revenues. And, and it will, it will, and we will continue to expand. We will continue to expand to almost all the emerging markets that there are. And, and just coming back to your earlier question on Saudi Arabia, while there is a lot of preconceived notions around, uh, you know, it might be a difficult place to do business in and all that. You know, I'd, I'd give you a small, small share uh, anecdote uh, that we were told that it will take six months to get, or even sometimes 12 months to get regulatory approvals. It, it took, we got it in six days. Literally, we were told that, you know, there would be a massive language barrier. It's a different way of doing business, etc. I'm so happy to tell, share with you that we've had zero attrition. Zero attrition since the time we took over um, and, and partnered together to make, uh, you know, sort of fly in, which is our Saudi Arabian uh, brand, if you will, fly in and clear trip are both coexistent in the markets for a different uh, for for different reasons. So 
in that team, we've had zero attrition. If you look at some of the, um, uh, you know, there is a massive amount of liberalization that has happened in, in terms of the, um, uh, in terms of the laws of the country, etc. At each step, we are getting bolstered by, by the quantum jump in demand that we are seeing in terms of our business. So Indranil, you've uh, had the opportunity to work with many different founders and founders come in all types of sizes, leadership styles and so on. If you were asked a question, what would be the three or four top uh, advice that you would give to founders, what they should watch out for? Because the re I believe founders are a special breed of people. Uh, they are not your regular folk because it requires uh, some kind of an inspiration calling to start a company and see that through. Perhaps passion, confidence, inspiration, motivation. You can have different words for it. But as somebody who's watching from the sidelines, what advice would you like to give to founders of companies? Or even for people who are planning to start a company? I must start my answer with an analogy, right? You know, what makes a good founder, right? You know, let's perhaps talk about that for a minute, right? And I imagine myself driving on a, you know, have densely forested road, right? Which, which is pitch dark. There's, other than the headlights of the car, there is nothing that you can see. And even those headlights are barely 100 meters ahead of you, right? You can see that. What makes you, gives you the confidence to drive at 80 or 100 miles an hour on those roads? The fact that you know that the road will not end or there is a road beyond the 100 meters you see. And you, you could fall into a ditch. You could fall off the cliff. You know, who knows, right? But you keep going and you keep driving. That's what makes a founder. First, a person with that innate confidence that yes, my idea is going to work. My f only advice to a founder would be don't lose sight of that idea. My second advice would be and this is not my original, but I'm a big believer in what Steve Jobs said, right? You know, in his 2005 convocation speech, stay hungry, stay foolish. And my third advice be, hire a good CFO who's going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> that I love that last pitch for the role of the CFO. <laughs> so, Indranil, as the CFO, you're expected to have a very sharp focus on the bottom line. Of course. Okay. EPS, profit, EBITDA, IRR, what have you. Okay, but today businesses are much more than bottom line, right? True. We are talking of social impact. We are talking of social responsibility. We are talking of shared values. So in this new emerging scenario, where making money is not the only goal, where does that leave you as a CFO? When you talk about, no, we need to focus on cost and money and your CEO and your founder is telling you, you know, that's not important. I'm more interested in how many people I can impact. So what do you say to that? If the CFO of today is saying, I need to focus on cost and money, then there is a certain amount of re-education that is required according to me. That's my personal view, right? There's nothing wrong with focus on cost and money. You said one something in your question had the word emerging. Which state of company are you in? If this is an emerging market growth stage company, you should be focused on growth. You should be, you have a sharper focus on the top line, the social impact and so on and so forth. All of the good things because today you are in a state where you're, you are outstripping the secular growth rate in the market. Once you've finished growing or I wouldn't, you can never finish growing, but once you've reached that or achieved equilibrium because all things do eventually, by automatically you would continue to have a sharp focus on your and don't lose obviously you have not lost sight of your bottom line automatically you will optimize for your profits having said that i also don't want to bear losses as the badge of honor right which has unfortunately been a fallout in some certain of the cases that we've seen you want to make sure please you know, let us look at the fundamental principles of business. Most of these businesses are being run with money from investors. You want to make sure you manage your investors' money more carefully than you manage your own money. And as a resultant of that, use 
and redeploy every available dollar towards increasing your presence, whether it is revenue, social media, brand, top of the mind, whatever it is, which all translates into ultimately into furthering your top line goals, but with an extremely sharp focus on how much are we spending, are the unit economics going out of control? And if it is, get it corrected, move on. So spoken like a true CFO. But if you were to redefine this role, as you see the role is being changed. Correct. So do you think you should even be called CFO? Maybe that F in the middle should change to something else. I would say to a B. Okay. You should be called the Chief Business Officer. Chief Business Officer. So Shantanu, you know, it's, it's been a wonderful uh, few minutes talking to you. I just wanted to get uh, something that uh, maybe your perspective and you, you've you not only been an entrepreneur yourself, you've run, you, you obviously speak to a lot of people and, and I wanted to get your perspective. And again, I'll start my question with an analogy. So help me out here saying that, you know, when the rest of the folks in the jungle they go to the, the the Lion King or the whatever to cry to to medi, medi, sort of uh, mediate between them, right? You know, if there is a problem or whatever, where does the lion go to find his solutions? Indonesia, that is a really fantastic question, and you know, a lot of people say that you know it's lonely at the top, and the founder's journey is always very alone. Uh, so, who does the founder talk to? I think the answer is mentorship. I think uh, not just in my own journey, but if you really go deep into the journey of many successful entrepreneurs from across the world, you will see that the one important thing that everybody talks about or ought to talk about is the importance of good advice. Skills and talent and competencies can be acquired for money. Good advice, good mentorship is priceless. And I think it's very important for founders to also scale as the organization scales. And that's a sensitive topic that a lot of people don't talk about, which is why when you hear about this, it is from a newspaper headline that the board decides to sack the founder. Why does that situation happen? Because it's being emotionally involved in the organization that you created. I think it's very important to be passionate, but simultaneously, it's also very important to be detached. Detached to the extent that you worry about the organization more than you worry about your own role and your own position. And, you know, we have very interesting situations happening today where the role of the founder is not sacrosanct or not to be taken for granted. For example, when you acquire other entrepreneurial companies, which happens all the time, one of the founders got to step aside and got to go. So I think that's where uh, good advice, wisdom, intelligence uh, and mentorship is really required. Uh, because while founders are sometimes great at starting companies, they may not be the best to take their companies uh, to the next level. And somewhere you have to separate being a shareholder and being a part of executive management. And I see that the board of directors has a great role to play in terms of not just oversighting the business, but also providing that adult uh, advice to the founder of the company. Wonderful. Talking to Indranil was very interesting because he represents a generation of people who, while they have come from uh, very traditional uh, backgrounds, uh, if you look at Indranil's past, a very educated uh, family from Kolkata, did all the right things. Brilliant boy, cracked the chartered accountancy exam, got into a job. But after that, the way he's charted the course of his life, I think is an interesting lesson out there for all of us. Uh, firstly, uh, the ability to gain as much experience as possible. So he switched jobs, switched roles, and finally, he's at the epicenter of a revolution that's happening in the travel industry with ClearTrip. Indranil also has a very clear vision about how the role of the CFO is changing. And as he likes to say, CFO should become chief business officers. 
I think there's an interesting uh, lesson out here because uh, the corporate world so far has been divided into silos. So there's, an, there's HR and there's finance and there's operations and technology. And finally, there's the founder or the CEO who's sitting like a lord on top of all of this. But maybe in the future, these roles and these lines are actually getting blurred and getting fuzzy. And each person in the organization has to have the multi, multi-dimensional skill set to take the organization to the next level. I also love the way he spoke about what founders should be thinking and how they should be uh, acting. I think it's really important for founders to have a very strong team, to surround themselves with very smart people who are not simply people who are overawed because there are lots of charismatic founders around, but who actually act as a sounding board and also provide um, sound advice and definitely Indranil represents the next generation of professionals who know exactly what their role is and who are part of the core team to take the organization uh, strategy forward. Uh, thank you, Indranil, for the time. Thank you so much for this today.